carbon dioxide is the basis of life, essentially. Um, so the atmosphere has a certain amount of carbon dioxide in it, and that's taken up by plants in the process known as photosynthesis. So the CO2 in the atmosphere around the plant, and then the CO2 inside the leaves. And because that CO2 is being converted into sugars, and ultimately all the tissues of the plant, so it's being drawn down to lower concentrations. So there is a lower concentration of CO2 inside the leaf than there is outside. Now, the question of the ratio of those two might seem to be a rather technical topic, which it is, but it also is very important from the point of view of understanding how plants actually work. Because CO2 doesn't just randomly diffuse into leaves, there are tiny pores in the surface that are actually regulated, so they may be more open or more closed. These are called stomata. So the ratio of the CO2 concentration inside the leaf to that outside the leaf is a measure of the exchange rate um, between CO2 and water um, that is used by the plant. And as you can well imagine, in relatively dry climates, um, water is at a premium, so the stomata tend to be more closed. The ratio of CO2 inside the leaf to outside the leaf tends to be lower. That also means that the photosynthetic rate is, is lower. Now, there have been experiments on this subject um, done um, ever since the uh, late 1970s, in fact. It's become clear that that um, ratio for a given type of plant tends to be fairly conservative, fairly constant. The range is somewhere from about 0.5 to 0.9. Um, and in fact, um, most plants, most of the time, it's only about 0.7 to 0.8. So it's very tightly regulated by the plant. But then we have the question, why is it what it is? Now, we don't really know how, still, um, after about a century of research, we still don't know how stomata actually work. Um, just exactly how they do this trick um, is still very unclear. However, um, it's pretty clear that there is a certain outcome, and we can study that outcome through the lens of evolutionary optimality. Evolutionary optimality is the source of all of the rules in biology. There's a famous statement by um, the geneticist Theodore Dob Dobchansky um, that nothing in biology makes any sense except in the light of evolution. And by using the concept that natural selection eliminates everything that doesn't work or is, ineffic is inefficient, um, we can infer uh, rules of biology that are um, perhaps not as exact as the rules of physics, but at least are um, as predictable, if you like, or as, or as general as the rules of physics. And that's what a lot of my research now is aiming at. And the place I chose to start was with um, the prediction of this ratio. And that's partly because there's a lot of data on it, but partly because we could also assemble a whole lot more data um, by use of stable isotopes. Now, that requires a little explanation. Um, there are two naturally occurring isotopes, um, stable isotopes of carbon, um, carbon-12 and carbon-13. Carbon-13 is about 1% of the carbon um, in, in the world, in the universe indeed. Um, so it's uh, quite rare, but the key point is that chemically it's carbon, so it participates in all the reactions that carbon participates in, but many of those reactions go just a little bit slower with C13 than they do with C12. So that's the general rule with stable isotopes. The heavy isotope um, tends to react more slowly. And photosynthesis, of course, is a reaction involving carbon, and it's no exception. So photosynthesis goes a little bit more slowly with C13, and so there is discrimination when photosynthesis happens. So there's discrimination against the, the um, heavy isotope, and so plant material is always somewhat depleted in C13. And this can now be measured uh, very routinely and cheaply with a mass spectrometer. Um, so it's possible to take hundreds of samples, we just send them off to a lab and, and have them analyzed. Um, and many groups, of course, around the world have been doing this with plant material. Um, the special thing about this photosynthetic discrimination is that it varies according to this ratio of the internal to the ambient concentration of CO2. 
So it gives us a readout of the stomatal behavior, if you like, um, the behavior of these, um, of these pores that let CO2 in and water out. Now, I mentioned that um, this ratio tends to be lower in dry environments, but there's a little more to it than that. It's been known for some time um, that it seems to be higher in warm environments. And something that puzzled people a lot when it was first discovered, that as you go up mountains, you go to higher altitudes, um, it seems to be less as well, and nobody could figure out quite why that was. At least, there were some ideas developed over the years, but no comprehensive explanation. So what we have now is a comprehensive explanation um, based on evolutionary optimality, and it involves um, an assumption which is called the least cost hypothesis. And that considers the plant or the leaf as a factory. Let's say it's a factory with a manager who has to decide what to invest in, and basically it's looking at whether the investment um, should be made in water transport, which is of course necessary. If the plant's going to lose water, it has to transport it up from the soil, and that means having some tissues, maintaining some tissues to transport water. So that's one thing the plant has to invest in. Or should it invest in the biochemical machinery of photosynthesis? And there is a trade-off between those two, um, because if a plant is going to have a low um, so-called CI to CA ratio, then it's going to have to invest, invest um, it is able to invest less in water transport, but it then has to invest more in um, the biochemical machinery. And remarkably, um, with nothing more than sort of um, high school calculus, elementary calculus, and some simple, some of the si simplest possible um, equations to represent these, um, the trade-offs here in investment of I investment in um, water transport versus biochemical machinery, we were able to make a quantitative prediction um, of how this ratio should vary in response to the temperature in which um, a plant is living, the dryness of the atmosphere in which it's living, and the atmospheric pressure, because the atmospheric pressure influences not only the um, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, um, which goes down as you go up with up in elevation, um, but also the partial pressure of oxygen. Now, there's a story to, to the oxygen here because the one enzyme called Rubisco that does all of the photosynthesis um, in the world it's only ever appeared once. Sometimes it makes a mistake. Sometimes it grabs onto an oxygen molecule instead of a CO2 molecule. And that just basically results in, well, it's a long pathway, but it basically results in some CO2 being lost. That's a process called photorespiration, um, and it's, well, it's sort of a nuisance. Um, and plants can't avoid doing it. Um, they do, do it more at high temperatures, um, but they actually do it less at higher altitudes uh, because of the low partial pressure of oxygen and that turns out to be de decisive and that is the explanation. So we claim that is the explanation for, um, for the effects of atmospheric pressure um, on this ratio. So th the remarkable thing about our results here is that they actually work quantitatively. In other words, um, using a large compilation of um, data on the stable isotope composition. We have data from um, over 3,500 plants from all of the different habitats in the world. Um, so, so, so we have a large data set and we can, um, we can infer statistically what are the partial effects of temperature, atmospheric dryness and altitude. And the numbers agree within quite, the, within quite narrow um, error bars, uncertainty bars, um, they agree with our theoretical predictions. So we've got to a new level of understanding of this rather technical quantity. However, it doesn't stop there, um, because there's a very good reason why we wanted to, to know how this quantity behaves, because this quantity is a component of the standard model of photosynthesis, um, the model of Farquhar et al. 1980, which is one of the most cited papers in biology and one of the best things that we have in this field because it works extremely well and precisely. 
Um, so using the Farquhar model then, if we know, if we can predict from the environment what the value of this quantity should be, then we can actually predict the total amount of photosynthesis um, and therefore the total amount of CO2 uptake um, on a large scale. And that, of course, can then be tested in other ways. But another remarkable thing was that this is just one equation. A lot of the numeric models that are around um, are, have become quite complex, in part because they started by deciding that all kinds of plants should be divided into so-called plant functional types, uh, such as tropical grasses, uh, boreal, evergreen, needle-leaf trees, and so on. So a list of plant functional types, and that each, it was assumed that um, these would all behave differently, and so that each plant functional type has to have its own list of um, of parameter values in the model. Well, what we've done here applies to all of the plants that use the standard pathway of photosynthesis, so-called C3 photosynthesis, which is all trees, um, most of the major crops except for uh, maize and sugarcane, um, and most of the, even the non-woody plants um, apart from tropical grasses. So um, C3 photosynthesis is the standard pathway and our analysis applies to all of the plants that use the C3 photosynthetic pathway. Um, we can show that each plant functional type, when we divide up our data into plant functional types, we can show that um, indeed they have different characteristic values. So in the end this is this is very simple. We don't need a complex model with different plant functional types in it um, because at least for the so-called C3 plants, they're actually all behaving in the same way and following the same rules which are ultimately set by evolutionary optimality.